Um, thanks for coming, everyone. I really enjoyed um, Betty's session, but she's gone now, so she can't hear us. Um, so I um, uh, am going to talk to you today about state and state machines. And uh, this is a, a waffle maker from an actual motel that I stay at in Texas. Um, and uh, Texas-shaped waffles are very good. So the, 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 it's 45 minutes. My, th my plan is we're going to do sort of 20 minutes of slides and discussion, 20 minutes of angering the demo gods, and then five minutes of, um, of questions. Um, so we'll see how we go. So let's see what time is 10 o'clock. Okay. All right. So state is, is everywhere. We, um, you can glorify or vilify it, but the only thing we can't do is ignore it because it changes things. It pushes your app forwards. Um, so, so we love to hate it, right? But it's kind of like hating the fact that we have to eat. You know, soil is notwithstanding, um, there's, there's, there's nothing we can do about the existence of state. I mean, without state, our apps wouldn't do very much. But we can, because it's everywhere, we, it's in our interests to develop good, robust ways of handling state. Um, I won't bother with my remote. Okay. So there's ways of minimizing state and, um, and, and modeling and controlling state, so, which is good. You know, there's, it's easy to accidentally build more state into our code than is necessary, and that ends up with you know, the spaghetti code that we're all familiar with. So, um, but we can't make it go away completely. What we can do is, is isolate it and model it. So just to pick you know, REST as a good example. REST is something that gets rid of state out of our network interactions. But if you think about what's happening, there's, there's like a boatload of state going on for one tiny GET request. I mean, something simple as, or seemingly simple as a JSON parser. I mean, parsers, if you've written a parser, are basically this enormous ball of state, um, you know, as it's jiggling through your file and keeping track of things. But, but we don't think about it much because it actually works pretty well. I mean, something like a, between the TCP and IP and the Ethernet driver, and there's so much state and, and so much complexity, but, but it, it actually usually works pretty well, except if it's written by Apple. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that there's, they're, they're, they're well designed and well modeled. So um, TCP is a good example, or, or network protocols are a good example where um, people have over the years developed ways of you know, documenting and describing and then modeling both the protocol to make sure it works and then also the, you know, validating the code that implements that to make sure that it works. It's not just sort of a trial and error, let's, let's keep hacking on it until, until we run out of bugs. Um, and you know, that seems a little esoteric. It's not all that often that we write a, a TCP stack. We do sometimes, but less often, uh, develop protocols. But actually, if you think about it, there's a lot in our apps that look a lot like protocols. We, we make a network request. We compare that to something in the database. If that matches or doesn't match, we do something else. You know, we maybe handshake between our app and our watch extension or something like that. Um, we, 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 it's actually a very common pattern. We just sort of conceptually think about them as, as you know, these structured protocols and then just stuff that our app does. Um, so we, 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 want to, um, we want to make this you know, modeled and, uh, and robust. Um, we can't use the power of wishy thinking, unfortunately, um, to, to make our, you know, the state in our apps work. There's, there's, a, there's a number of really common um, problem cases that we hit. Um, so, so we'll have to stick with star maths, or uh, well, not star maths, but maths in general. Um, so, what we're going to we're going to talk about a couple of things, and it's important to realise that um, I'm just going to take this off because otherwise you're uh, going to be all distracted by wishy thinking. Um, what what I'm going to talk about? Th these aren't just programming techniques; they're they're rigorous mathematical models that are that have had a lot of research. That there's ways to analyze them and, uh, and you know, they have known properties and known things you can do with them. Um, so we're going to start with Petrinets for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a more powerful technique compared to finite state machines that we'll cover in a minute. Um, and also finite state machines are a, a complete subset of Petrinets, so we, do, we don't have to cover two bases at once. 
Um, quick show, who's, who's, who knows what a Petronet is or has sort of heard about them or seen them in lectures? One, okay, two, good. Okay, so um, at this stage, if I was a computer science lecturer, I would have been like talking about four tuples and, and you know, showing you like equations and things, but I'll show you a diagram because I think actually it works a lot better. So here's a, um, here's a so th there's, a, there's a standard, um, you know, ratified way of visually describing patterns. This is kind of, kind of that. Um, so there's, there's a few things going on. So the, the circles are called places. They're not called states, they're called places. Um, the, the rectangles are, um, let me get the terminology correct, because um, they change with other diagrams, Tra transitions or events. So transitions are events or actions. So they're either internal or external. Um, you know, it's either a signal that's coming in from outside or maybe it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an action that's being triggered. And then um, we have all these arcs, right? And they're called input relations and output relations. So an input relation is something that's, that's, that's coming into a um, place and an output relation is an arc that's going out of a place. And they can have conditions and whatnot. Um, I've just got a very simple case here. So, uh, and, and before we go through the simulation, the, the other thing to point out is that so we have all these transitions in here, and unlike a finite state machine where it's very clear you can only be in one state at once, in a Petronet, there's the, Petronets are used for modeling um, parallel systems, so multiple things can be happening at once. So how you know what can happen at any point in time is whether the input relations of the, um, uh, whether the arcs that are going into the transitions have their conditions met. Uh, and it's very simple to know if they have the conditions met because conditions is whether they have the correct number of tokens available. And, it, and the little dot is the token. So in this case, um, there's nothing particularly complex. Every input arrow requires one token. So we can see that the only transition that can possibly fire here is a sign author. So this is a, this is a workflow for like a news desk, right? So some interesting things happens, and we, we're going to sign an author. So that transition fires. And so one other quick thing to point out is that this is, this is for modeling processes in general. This could be a computer system. Or it could be, we could be 50 years ago, and this is just pieces of paper going into people's in tray. Uh, there's, there's, there's no difference um, other than obviously you can't automatically do things through that mechanism. So okay, so we've so we've signed off that. Um, again, we've only got one transition that can fire, which is write article. Um, that happens. You know, it takes some time. Some things are instant. Some things take some time. So now we have an interesting case where we have two possible transitions that can fire: a fail review or pass review can both fire because both of them have their input conditions met. But only one can happen because as soon as one happens, let's say it fails the review, um, the token is gone, right? So we, so we can't do failing review and passing review in parallel, which makes sense. Write the article, this time we pass the review. So now something interesting happens. We have a little annotation here saying times three, which means that whenever a token comes into this place, any tokens that come in, we, it, it's triple the number of tokens Kind of, kind of appear. So uh, this is how this is how we model um, parallel work. So let's say editing approval, legal approval, and layout normally take about half a day each. Doing these things in serial versus doing the parallel is the difference between hitting the story in today's newspaper or, or tomorrow's newspaper. So it's important that they they all happen at once, even if there's a bit of wasted effort. So um, let's say you know layout, the layout and editor are ready to go, but the the you know, legal department's quite busy. Um, the publish uh, step, which here I make labeled as automatic, so if this is a computer system, it could be there's no final step, right? As soon as that fires, the, the article will go live on, on the website. Um, except it can't fire because its input requirements are that three, you know, there's one token available on each of these inputs, which there isn't. Um, the legal guy gets around to it, uh, and then it'll, it'll automatically publish. So that, in a nutshell, is a Petronet. And when you, when you work with them, you tend to describe them uh, visually like this. And there's, there's lots of tools. They're all quite bad, um, which let you simulate them and, um, and, and things like that. So that's a simple example and a complex example, which I'm not going to um, simulate or run through, but to show you the kind of things that people use this for. So this is, this is a, an application that sends an email to SMTP send. So if you've ever worked with SMTP or other mail protocols, you'll know that they're complex and painful. Um, and uh, it's the sort of scenario where it's incredibly easy to, you know, you, you read an RFC and you've got this wall of text 
and you, you sort of implement code and you come with design and you, you kind of hope, you use your wishy thinking and hope that you've implemented it correctly. And in a case of something like SMTP or IMAP or whatever, it's, it's just not really possible. You know, that there's, there's, you know, there's so many amendments and things that, that uh, so many potential cases that you're just going to be debugging endlessly. Uh, so first of all, PetriNets can be used for, if, if someone, let's say someone's designing something like SMTP, you can validate that the protocol is correct, that you don't have edge cases. Um, and then you can also use it to validate your, your software design. Um, so what sort of verification analysis can you do? Well, there's, so we, we looked at the visual design and there's a there's a one-to-one -one mapping to a, 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 a mathematical description. So using, using um, vectors and matrices. And there, it's a non-lossy transformation. You can, you can take that visual, that visual diagram and you can mechanically translate it into vectors and matrices and, and vice versa. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a lot of academic work around the sort of analysis you can do. Um, here's a couple of examples. So reachability is one good example. You know, you've gone, you've gone to this careful um, effort to define all these places in your, in your um, you know, process because you know that they're real things that exist. And so if actually, in fact, it's not possible for the preconditions of one place to ever, of one transition to ever you know, occur all at once, then obviously you've got a problem in your protocol because you, know, you didn't make that place for no reason. Completion is similar if you have a, not, not, all, not all processes terminate, you know, some things are infinite loops, but if you have something that terminates, then um, uh, completion is, first of all, you know, your tokens have to be able to get to your completion state, and, and, and also all, you know, all of the tokens in play have to either be there or disappear, otherwise you actually don't ever terminate. Um, so I, I th hope you can, and, and actually, sorry, k-boundedness is an interesting one, I, it's a stupid name, um, but that's computer science for you. So k-boundedness allows you to basically run a simulation through a PetriNet and work out what's the maximum number of tokens that can be in every place at, at, or in any given place at one time. So that's very useful for checking that you're not overusing a resource. So let's say in our publishing one, it's very simple. If you've got three authors then, um, and you want to handle five articles a day, you can work out, well, is that possible or not? Um, in a, in a uh, software example, if, you are, if you're modeling a system, in, let's say you're implementing, I don't know, an SMTP stack in an embedded system, we have very limited RAM, uh, you could work out, okay, well, are we going to actually try and allocate more, but more, um, you know, more variables to the stack than we actually have RAM for? Um, and, and then, you know, you can, you can mitigate that or change the design or whatever. So, um, and response time analysis is interesting, so I didn't cover it in that PetriNet, but you can have, um, you, you can annotate your transitions and places and say, well, this incurs a certain amount of delay or, or you know, this takes a certain amount of time and then you can work out, okay, what's the maximum time that things will take. So another sort of canonical example that, that computer science texts use is uh, the triage process in, of a hospital. So that's quite, quite interesting because, again, it's just a human process. Um, and you can map it all out, you know, it's a strict process and then you can work out, okay, well, um, you know, what's the longest time anyone will wait and, and you know, is that a problem? Um, so that's, um, th that's the more complex. Um, so I imagine that there's a lot more people who are familiar with and have interacted with finite state machines compared to PetriNets. So um, like I mentioned, finite state machines can be considered a subset of PetriNets. Uh, you, can, you, and you can model any finite state machine in a PetriNet but not, not vice versa. Um, so uh, um, PetriNets are really mostly useful for, for modeling because they, they, they're useful for modeling entire systems. Um, in, in terms of uh, you know, concrete use, the only place I've seen them used in, in terms of like say generating software or what have you is in, is in something like SNCV, right? very complex protocols. Um, and in any case, we probably want to model our, uh, um, we want to model our processes into smaller chunks. So we can usually, you know, abstract the, the parallelism in a different way. So a finite state machine is actually what we're going to use in our code in a minute. So here's a finite, here's a finite state diagram. Um, so we have a, uh, there's a, there's a starting place, which is our, our black dot, uh, and then we have, we have states and transitions. It's much simpler. So the reason why I was careful to point out in the PetriNet that, that they're called places, not states, and that's because PetriNets, certainly certain PetriNets can be designed so there's actually infinite possible states 
um, because the state there is defined by well, where are all your tokens and, and they can be anywhere um, at once potentially. So find a state we, we, we are only ever in, if you think of a token, which doesn't conceptually exist, a token is only ever in one of these states. It can't be in, in more than one place at once. Um, so this is a pretty simple example, you know, we log in, succeeded, um, I'm not going to talk you through it because I'm sure you all understand. One thing to point out when you are, so, so our modeling process would be, you know, we think of something and we're going to draw a diagram and then turn that into code. Uh, and it's important, it's a super easy trap to fall into to actually draw a flow chart rather than a state diagram, which then isn't going to work um, for our translation. So the, 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 the difference is um, a flow chart in our little boxes where we're writing an action, you know, do something, do a calculation, run a code, save something to disk. The state diagram, um, the states are, are actually nothing in themselves. A, a state contains no information other than telling you where you can go next. So um, uh, a state is like a, a, like a waiting place and the transitions are um, uh, where either an action happens, some, something actually occurs, or there's some sort of input signal. So it's a subtle difference. It's easy to, easy to screw that up. Uh, anyone here f uh, like listening to the radio? Anyone? Yes, okay, good. Um, because we're going to make one. Or rather, I've made one, and it's over there, and I'm hoping that we can actually get some reception. Um, we have a, a, an SI470X chip, which is basically an FM receiver that can receive very simple commands, um, and an RF tweener, which we're going to talk to with Bluetooth to control the, the chip. It's very simple though. Uh, it, it basically it can, um, well it's actually very complex, but it, has, it offers a very simple API. Well, we, can, we can seek up or seek down or tune to a channel. Um, that's pretty much it. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to be twiddling the knobs like, a, like you know, we're, we're, we're an older person. Um, we want to hit a button and say, find me all of the radio channels in my area. And so if you think about it, we can implement that super easy with, with that API described. We, we you know, hit a button and say, I want to start scanning. So we seek up, and it's going to find the first strong channel it can find. Um, so that's our seeking up. It's found a result. Uh, we're going to process that result. And then one of two things can happen. Uh, either we, you know, we find a channel, we're going to save it, and we notice that we've wrapped all the way around, which means we've finished. Right? We can then skip to finish. Or our result didn't wrap, and then we simply go back and we seek up again. Uh, and then we realize, OK, well, actually, uh, obviously, errors can happen in both of those places. Um, and also, in the seeking, we could have a timeout. Right? Maybe there's no channels in our area, and it's just going to keep wrapping around and not stop. So in our code, we want to have a timeout to handle that situation. So this sort of completely describes what we want to implement. And we think it's, it's pretty easy to, to implement that just in code manually. But you know, I picked a simple example, and we're going to use a state machine. So like Petrinets, there's a one-to-one uh, -one correlation between our visual description and, and in this case, a tabular description. So um, what you have in a state table is down the left, we have the possible input states. So finish isn't there because there's, no, there's nothing past that. So we only have seeking up and processing results. And then across the top, you have the, uh, the transitions. So it's a, it's a sparse table, right? Because not all transitions apply to all states, but some apply to more than one, like error. Um, so, and then, and then you can just sort of look up the grid, right? It's pretty obvious, like, okay, well, if we're in the processing result state uh, and, you know, a timeout happens, well, we do nothing, or um, a didn't wrap happens, and then we transition to seeking state. So it's, it's an equivalent description of how you navigate. It's just to, you know, it's less, less intuitive to us. Um, but that's then something we can easily turn into code, right? So, so you can imagine a method, we have a, we have a method that gets called when, it says, uh, didn't wrap, and we check some internal state, right? We'll say, oh, will we process the result, or we're we seeking up, and therefore, you know, if this, then do that, else that. Um, and that's the sort of code we write all the time. But why not let the computer do it? I mean, we've, in that table, we have a, a, a concrete, explicit description of exactly what should happen in our code. Um, there's, there's no need for us to write if statements and set Boolean flags and whatever. We can, we can generate code to do that from that table, because it's a known format, and, and as complex as it gets, we can, we can continue to auto-generate it. So um, everyone's sitting down, which is good, because I'm going to show you a website from SourceForge. Um, and uh, this, there's, there's, there's quite a few projects that take a, a, some sort of description of a state machine and will auto-generate basically an object to model that state machine for you. Um, all of them have disadvantages. 
uh, this one has, has the least disadvantages. Um, one of which is it's a terrible website. The other one is that it's written in Java. Um, they're not really important. There's more important deficiencies. But there's a, a bunch of good things. So one is you can sort of see there in the blue on blue, um, it has a heap of output languages. So Objective-C, which is important here. Um, it can also output uh, Python and, and Ruby. So you can, you can also model some server-side things. Um, you can output raw C and Java and you know, all sorts of useful things. Um, one day I'm going to write my own because uh, to fix all the deficiencies, of course, as we all are. But for now, this is fine. So here's an example of a definition file. The other re one of the other reasons I like SMC is that, um, so smc.sourceforge.net, if you didn't catch that URL, uh, is the, the, the file format is very simple and it basically looks like that state table I described. So um, if you format it out this way, you, look, you basically read down the left and we have our states, right? We have, so ready is, is kind of a, an arbitrary state. Uh, we have scanning, we have processing channel, and we have finished, just, just like our diagram, right? Um, ignore default for a second. Then inside those states, we have transitions, and they're like a laser pointer or a gadget arm. Um, we have uh, um, transitions, so, so found channel, um, you know, did receive data, did timeouts. It's a little more implementation specific here. And then after the transitions, there's an optional guard in square brackets. So, um, so for example, you can see in processing channel, the, the state machine I've defined is going to receive a found channel signal one way or the other. The, the chip simply has found a channel. It's going to call back and say, I found a channel. Um, but we, but the, the, the rules are processed top down and most specific to least specific. So we can, we can easily just add a little um, Boolean condition on here to basic, which calls a method in this case, to check to say th this channel that's found compared to the ones we've seen so far, does it wrap? If it does, then we're going to part, then, then that first rule is going to apply. If not, then that second rule is going to apply. Um, the other thing to point out, so this, this default statement, um, you know, when we're visually drawing a state machine, you know, we're going to draw in all of the, all of the connections that, 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 that we have. In terms of defining it for code generation, it's quite useful to have this, this um, sort of explicit default statement. So that's, that's sort of the least specific one. So if no other rules apply, then these ones can apply. So that's useful in two cases. One is in cases where you want a particular transition to do the same thing everywhere. So, so like did receive error, um, we, if we receive an error at any point, we simply want to go to finished and then notify our delegate that an error occurred. So that's great because it means that if we come along later and iterate this state machine, we, we can't forget to put error handling in all of our states. So that's useful. The other thing it's useful for is to ignore things that, that we want to ignore at certain times. So uh, if you remember that table was sparse, right? If we get a timeout um, at any states that haven't explicitly said, here's what you should do with the timeout, then we want to ignore that. And that's, that's a good class of problems that we've solved straight away. So I don't know if you've ever hit this problem, but, but, but I hit it surprisingly often. So you implement something simple, uh, and then you realize, ah, oh, shit, that could time out. You know, that network might take too long, or you know, the user's going to be impatient, whatever. I know, we'll make a timeout. Easy. We'll put an NS timer. When that fires, it'll call something. It's going to cancel something. And then you get this bug report of something weird happening, and you look at the stack trace or whatever, and you say, how can this happen? You know, this, this method has been called after the whole process is already finished. That shouldn't happen. Um, and then you realize, oh, that's because out of this, you know, kind of flow of state, um, there's three ways that it can exit, and I only invalidated the timer in two of them. So now I'll put invalidate in the other one. Um, so in the code that, that I've got, which we might, which we'll get time to look at, um, I don't even invalidate the timer ever. I just set the timer and say, um, you know, call this method when, you know, call the, uh, did timeout when, when the timer finishes. Um, and it doesn't matter if it calls after we finish because it's just going to hit the state machine and the state machine is going to say, oh, the end state is nil, which is a special case meaning stay in what the state you're in and it has no action. Um, okay. So the, another thing I like about SMC is that it's um, surprisingly not all state machine compilers do this. It can output a visual representation. It's not particularly pretty. It uses GraphViz and just automatically connects in. But you can, you can see that it's, it's, it's achieving the same thing as our visual diagram. So that's good in the initial case for um, you know, validating have I, you know, have I kind of written this text file to, to actually match the state machine that I'm trying to describe. And it's also super useful when you've modified it later or someone else is debugging it. 
and they say the same kind of problems, like how the hell did it get into this state? And you realize, oh, it's because you know, an error happened here, and maybe that's correct, or maybe you realize you need to change the state machine. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to look at something like this and say, um, you know, is this doing what I think it should be doing than to trace through a whole bunch of if statements and asynchronous callbacks to work out the same thing. Um, and if it's in this diagram, you know it's what's going to happen because you've got this generated code. If you have a transition that isn't handled in your definition, then that'll, that's going to raise an exception or raise an error. Um, so we've got our, we've got our um, um, you know, definition file. We use the smc.jar to generate, in our case, an Objective-C implementation header file. Um, and then we, we write our own manual object that's going to be part of our object, uh, part of our application. And that's, um, that's going to ha you know, have a state machine object. And then we also set ourselves as the delegate. So, because the, there's, there's, there's method calls going in both directions. We're going to basically push signals into the state machine to say, you know, time to move on to your next state. Um, and we're going to get callbacks, which are the, the action methods. Um, okay, so let's do a demo. Um, so we have, we have software and hardware and um, radio physics demo gods who we're angering simultaneously. Um, okay, so I'll show you that um, the actual generated state machine objects are not particularly inter interesting other than the methods we call. So let's look at this seeker.h. So this is the object that, is, that, that I've written by hand, which, is going to, which the application is going to call to say, please find all the channels. Um, so, uh, okay, so we have these two methods here, which is where I'm passing in the data from Bluetooth. I'm just blindly receiving the data from the call Bluetooth delegate and, and shoving it into, um, into there. Uh, and then here we have... Um, so those guards, remember, I told you there's the, there's the Boolean tests you can apply to basically the transitions to see which transition fires. Um, if it's a simple Boolean against you know, the, da the object that's been passed into that transition, um, sorry, I, sh I should explain one more thing quickly um, about that file format. So, okay. Um, so in the transitions, you'll see here, this transition has an object passed in. So, uh, which, which corresponds to a method we call we pass an object in. Um, this object can then be used anywhere else in this rule. So, um, uh, well, here's, here's a good example. So, this did receive data, takes a single argument, and it's data. Uh, and we can call this method on this to check a Boolean, or maybe it was just an integer, and we can check is it greater than something. Um, so, you can use this object anywhere through this rule, including in this, um, this action. So, effectively, we're going to call a method and pass through this object. Uh, so that's nice. It means we don't have to like save it on an instance variable or something. It just flows through the, the rule. So we have, uh, in some cases, it's, it's not that simple. You, you've got much too, much, far too much logic to sort of shove into this format file. So in this case, um, there's a, a method we're going to call to say, hey, does this channel wrap? Uh, and then here are the action methods. So these are the methods that are actually going to be called back to us from the finite state machine. Um, so that's where all the actual, actual work is going on. So to sort of show you why that's nice, let's look at these methods. So um, they're, they're all, uh, apart from the channel wraps, where we have to keep track of the, the last channel found, so we know if we wrapped around, um, the rest of these have no internal state at all. You know, seek up is just, hey, we're going to send a command to the chip of the BLE. Um, start timer, which is when we're starting our timeouts, it doesn't know anything. All it knows is, oh, I just start a timer, and then when it times out, I call the did timeout method on the finite state machine. Um, and when we say uh, process channel data, again, it's, it's purely taking um, some data, and which we've saved to an instance variable, uh, and, and then processing it. Um, this is one of the things that, that, one of the weaknesses that I don't quite like, because, so, so you'll notice that all of these states have entry actions. Um, or can have entry actions, so that's just again a method that's called back when you enter that state, so that's how you can take actions based on state change. Um, there's, there's no way to pass an object into that. Uh, if, if, if you had kind of, I guess like in a petronet, we had this idea of a token object that got passed around that could embody the state, then that would, that would mean that we, we, wouldn't, we could model, I think, that much nicer. We wouldn't have to save it into instance variables. Um, the, kind of the idea of a, of a finite state machine is because it can only be in one state at once, 
the idea is, well, that object does manage the state, and that's okay. And it is okay. It, it just could be a little bit cleaner for testability. Um, but even so, all these methods you can see are, are super easily testable. I mean, in this case, they're almost trivial. Um, they're literally just passing data around and they're doing something. You know, this would be very simple to test. Um, that's that. So let's run it and see if it works, and then we're going to make some changes. Um, so, uh, here we go. All right, so it's found the BLE device. We're going to connect, and then we're going to start scanning. Now, let's see how um, much RF we can receive in here. Not a lot. I didn't test it here. Let me just make sure I have my antenna connected. Um, and otherwise, the demo is going to be a lot less interesting than I thought. It's definitely there. We'd get an error if it wasn't. Let's try again. Oh, no, it's gone off. Is everyone doing their demo god dance? That's oh, there we go. That sounds better. There we go. I thought that was going to work. There we go. We're finding channels. Um, so we can see. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's sort of a couple of flaws in the system. One is we're finding a whole bunch of channels that are actually very weak. And the other one is we get that annoying, um, you know, hitting all the channels as we go through. Um, here we go. It works. Okay. Now, let me just get rid of that for a minute. Okay. So now we're going to make some, some super quick changes. So, so the first one is um, we don't want that annoying, you know, hearing the little bits of the channels as it's going through. So that's very simple. Again, if we think about our process, we just want to mute at the start of scanning and unmute at the end. Now, kind of like with a timeout, the problem you hit doing that manually is you just say, oh, sweet, I'm going to mute, unmute, and you forget that there's different ways. You forget that you could out error, exit from a timeout or an error, and then you accidentally leave your radio muted. Now, in our case, it's going to be super easy. We're just going to go to our um, finite state machine object, and let me check my notes. Uh, so we're going to... Right, so basically when we start, before we, before we say set starting channel, we're just going to say, okay, we want, we want to call back on our object that says mute. Uh, doesn't really matter there, white space. And then um, we're going to add a new entry action into the finish state, which says unmute. So we've got all of our, um, oh, I think I did a couple of um, we did all of, we've got all of our edge cases handled because every case that finishes goes to finished. The only way to start is to go through start. So we, we know it's impossible to accidentally leave the, um, the device uh, muted. So now, um, now I've got a little Python script that sort of wraps it. We're just going to compile state machines, uh, which runs it twice to also update the, um, the, the PDF. So, so we think that's right. So we can, we can have a look at the, our output PDF and see did we get it right? And we can say, yes, we've got, a, we've got um, mute here and uh, unmute here. OK, that's, that's good. And the, the, the process that I go through when I use this is I just make the state machine and then I build and run. And it's going to fail because I haven't implemented those methods yet. Um, so, uh, so the way I've got it here is, is I'm using the default configuration, which basically expects the objects to appear on an object. You have to specify what class it is. You can also set up to use a protocol. Um, which makes it easier for testing, also makes it easier if you want to implement the object in Swift. But I, I just did it the easy way here. So we need to implement, um, it's saying the seeker class doesn't implement mute or unmute, which is true. So that's easy. We're just going to copy and paste them in. So add these to seeker.h. Oops. Ah. Duh. What? Okay, uh, back up. I have it elsewhere. Just a little less convenience. Okay, so add this to seek H. Um, so these, I'll put them down here. Oops, and then add the, so the implementations again are totally stateless, right? We're just, in this case, um, sending a command to say mute and unmute. And now, 
Uh, ah, because that's, okay, so you saw what I did there. What I'm actually going to do to make sure I have the correct header file is uh, let's go to second states. Okay, so there we go. Mute and unmute with the uh, correct commands. Let's run. Connect. Sensations. Nice and quiet. All right. Um, the other change that we'll that we'll make uh, is, um, which I'll just do the checkout. Is so the other thing that that was a problem that I said was it finds a whole bunch of channels. So the chip just says has some very low threshold of finding a channel, um, but but we want to find only strong channels. So the change that I just made then. Um, was was this? So you remember we have this found channel with a with a uh, uh, if we find a channel and we've wrapped around, we don't store that channel anymore. We simply notify success. And then what we had before was we just had if you find any other channel, um, continue in scan, go back to scanning and notify channel found. So I've just added a, a a condition to that to say well only if the channel dot RSSI, which is the signal strength, is greater than 100, should we notify of the channel being found to our delegate, otherwise we just keep scanning. So I didn't actually change the object at all. I, I, li I literally just changed this file, regenerated the state machine, and then now when we, um, when we run, it's going to find far fewer channels. Um, 100 is actually a bit low, some of them will still just be static, but you'll, uh, you'll get the idea. There you go. So you can see it's coming through much much slower. I'm just going to find a fairly, in here, probably a fairly small number of channels. Um, and the one last, uh, in our one minute, um, uh, just more for a nice demo than it's, um, is I have a, I added a little bit of um, RDS uh, decoding. So very basic RDS decoding, not proper RDS decoding. Um, we basically, within this processing channel, if we receive, we can now just receive some raw data um, because we've requested a read RDS, which again sends a command to the chip. We get some arbitrary data back. Um, we can parse the data and um, build and run. So the reason why that's interesting is that, so here I just did the really super simple RDS decoding. You can get a simple string. Oh, RDS is radio, it's the thing that shows you the channel name in your car, right? Um, and you can also have really interesting information like traffic and whatever. Um, so. The way RDS works is you have these very tiny little packets of data that come in um, you know, every few microseconds in kind of like the, the just past the normal FM um, audio data. And here I'm just getting the, the, the um, channel ID, which, which is very easy to decode. If you want the extra information like, this, like the song name or station data, the way you would implement that is you actually implement another state machine just to do that because what you have is there is you literally have a protocol. You're receiving bits of data. You need it, it might drop in and out, so you need there's sync packets you look for, um, and and you could you could model that. You know, really hard to implement that kind of thing, uh, but you, you you know you can read the spec, design a state machine, and then here you would simply get some data, pop that out to another state machine, and use that to basically you know parse the data. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty much my uh, my demo, um, and there's not okay yeah there's the, the signal quality is probably too weak to get some um, get RDS data. Um, so that's uh, that's it. Does anyone have any uh, any questions in uh, negative one minutes? Yes. Um, I've, been, I've been reading a bit recently about states machine and how you can use them to that one manage states and how you can combine like this button to like for I asked about and just new controllers so yeah. you can use um, the state machine inside of your controller to manage the state and like you know just segregate it into this controlled space. Have you done anything simple? See, uh, yeah, I, I'm not this. I'm not sure I would use it for. Um, a view control because so I think something like functional reactive programming is much better in that case because you have um, you, you know you, you have these arbitrary things that can happen at any one time including things that can happen out of order and when something happens out of order or a user hits a button that maybe they shouldn't um, you you know it's 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 kind of a fairly complex system to be sure that you've modeled that entirely um, 
I mean, you, you could. There's no reason why you couldn't. But um, yeah, you'd have to go through this sort of pretty careful modeling exercise. And then when you, every time you want to change the UI, you have to sort of remodel your state machine. Um, as opposed to something like this, where you know you, you specify something, and you know if something happens out of order, that's an error, you know, and then it's simply not possible to recover from that. Um, whereas functional reactive programming, I think, works better because you have this idea of, hey, I've just got all these. When when something comes in, um, you know, I'm going to respond to it and make some kind of action, and you also have a whole bunch of outputs. Like, so you, you have a lot of different state outputs, like you know which controls are enabled or disabled at various times, and you could link that to states as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I suspect that, that, that you would spend, yeah, that, that it would be quite difficult to model that. Yep. Testing, so you can like describe all the possible states and actions yep. and just add the noise in property testing. Yeah, so there's a few things that, that people talk about with that. So so one one thing is um, absolutely true that, that one of the beauties of modeling it this way is that everything is very easily testable and you've got effectively a specification you can test against. Um, some of the articles you see people talking about that though, to me is so you know, I described the system I described here is we, we're defining a specification and then we're generating code out of that. Um, we don't test that state mission object. I mean, the, 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 that whole framework is well tested. And if you've defined a, specific, a, a, a state machine, that object is going to behave in that way. Um, uh, now, you can use state machines or PetroNets to model something and then just implement it by hand. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's good to always have more modeling than less modeling. Um, but if it's a case where, where you can actually specify it and turn that into code, then to me that's a lot better than saying, hey, we can write some code and then we can also define a state machine to check that we've written that code correctly, that we don't get into an inconsistent state. Well, if you're using a, a state machine model like this, it implicitly cannot get into an inconsistent state. So um, I've seen some articles talking about that and I'm like, oh, well, that's sort of wasted effort. You're doing it twice. Yeah, which is one of the benefits here. I, like, I, I'm not writing unit tests to make sure I can't get into the wrong states because I know I can't. What I'm doing is writing unit tests to check, hey, when this action fires and I'm supposed to send some BLE data, am I formatting that packet correctly? Am I decoding data correctly? You know, the actual functions, yep. which, which to me makes more sense. Thanks. Um, that's probably, uh, probably all we have time for.